Earlier this year, we were sitting in these stools and you had been newly appointed to the Ethics Committee in the U.S. House, and I asked you about the Santos investigation. You couldn't comment on it really at all. Time has passed. Uh, the report has been released. Now you're freer to talk? Absolutely. So once the report has been completely released, members of the Ethics Committee can speak on it. In fact, the chair of the Ethics Committee has introduced a resolution to expel Santos. So clearly, we can talk. But it was very important that while this investigation was going on, which was extremely thorough, bipartisan, and then, of course, our vote to make the report public um, was unanimous. During that time, it was just very important for the process, for due process, that members of the Ethics Committee um, kept an open mind, let all the evidence come through, and really didn't um, tip our hand. So before we get into some of these allegations, Walk me through the process. I mean, do you guys have a team of investigators or forensic accountants? Because I can't imagine all of you guys are doing this digging. When there's a lot of evidence, what we do is we appoint two Democrats and two Republicans to be on an investigatory subcommittee. And so two of our members of the committee were on this investigatory subcommittee. I was not. And they go through all of the evidence. But we have have a very, very good and competent staff to compile everything, to do all the drafting of the inquiries, to lay things out, and then they will write up the report. Now, of course, we can edit the report, we can comment on the report, but there is professional staff, including lawyers, involved in the entire investigation. What stood out to you most? What's the most egregious when it comes to this list of allegations against Santos? Well, what's most egregious is that Santos used his campaign as his personal piggy bank. So there are so many rules for how you use campaign funds, how you report those funds, how you interact with your donors. He violated all of those rules. So he was basically using campaign funds for personal use, but creating shell loans and um, relationships with organizations that he had control over, directing his staff to falsify records. He basically used the context of the campaign as a way to get money that he used for his personal benefit. Now, some of these false loans or allegations of fake loans were used to lure donors, right? Correct. So he would say, well, we need to make up the shortfall in our campaign so that we can buy yard signs or whatever. I'm just making up the yard sign part and say, this is why we need to get we need this money. But it was a lie. And in the meantime, he was using funds to travel for um, lavish expenses, for cosmetic, um, you know, uh, enhancements, so, let's well, just say. I mean, let's just get into it. Both Botox, Hermes, right. Ferragamo, yes. we can go on down the list. I mean, th these are high-end um, retailers that he was shopping at, allegedly. Correct. So, which goes back to my initial statement that he was using his campaign finances to fund his lifestyle. With all due respect to the committee, um, it's not the youngest crowd in the world. And I, I put myself in that category because I'm not either. Did they have to get a primer on what OnlyFans is? I mean, how, how many of them even knew what that well, is? Well, I, I was not on the investigatory subcommittee, so I don't know whether they got um, any kind of background. But we pretty much got the report in advance of our committee meeting because we had to vote all in person, face to face, to accept the findings of the report. The OnlyFans part, you know, I hate to hone on it so much, but it was one of the things that made people's eyes pop quite a bit in the headlines. Well, um, people had their favorite parts of the report, and I'm glad that was yours. I'm not saying it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not saying that. I don't have a favorite part. I'm unbiased. Speaking of ethics, uh, the Supreme Court came out with ethics reform or a list of mm -hmm. um, new rules that they will 
follow or say they will follow, but you've been highly critical of what their choices are and that perhaps they're not going quite far enough. Can you ex expand on that a little well, bit? Well, I want to start with the fact that they did at least create a code. That is good. However, the code isn't enforceable and doesn't have a lot of directives. So they use the word should instead of shall. And then there isn't a method of enforcement. And then, of course, this issue of recusal um, is, not, is left entirely up to a justice. So what I would say is it's a good first step, but now we need to see some teeth put into it. So this is the second vote to expel Santos. The first attempt failed because Republicans who did not vote in favor said they wanted to wait until the report was available, which is available to all of us now online to see. It takes a two-thirds vote, guys, to be thrown out of the U.S. House. It will be an interesting, interesting, and very public vote. Yeah, yeah. we'll see what happens. And with, yeah. re with reference yeah. to the SCOTUS, shall and should, there's like oceans right. of difference between those Major two things. Major difference, mm -hmm. absolutely. Russ, thank you. You bet.